All right, we're going to be live in just a moment. I'll start sharing my screen. All right. All right, can everybody see my slides? Give me just a quick thumbs yes. up. Yep. Yep. Okay, awesome. All right, we'll start letting people in here. How many people do you expect today? You know, I think we're gonna have about 40 people in the Zoom room, 40 to 50 people in the Zoom room, and then in YouTube, it depends, but I think at least 100, 100 or 150 people. So we should have a good, a good size group, hopefully more. All right, great. Now, I suddenly have lost the ability to um, mute and unmute, just FYI. Okay. Weird. Um, there, never mind. I'm good. Okay, you're good. All right. All right. Thanks, Michelle. Am I am I able to talk? Yes. Yes. Okay. You should be able to okay. mute. Uh, you should be able to I mute. The, I tried to do the mute, and the Alt A is not functioning for me. I don't hear it working anyway. So I may have to tab to unmute or mute. I don't know. Space mute is currently unmute. Yeah, I don't know that that works with Zoom. Just tab to the mute button and hit your space bar. And also, Richard, before you got on, Carly was she's going to also monitor us from a muting standpoint. She can she can control that too. Good. Yeah. Well, then just mute me uh, if you would, Carly, when you don't need me to talk. So that'll be fine. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. I'll, exactly. If I if I hear you heavy breathing or sneezing or anything, <laughs> I'll just mute you. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. It's great to see all of you here. Go ahead and share in the chat where you're tuning in from this morning. It's always fun to see where in the world everybody is. Michelle's in Alabama. I know Richard. Richard, where are you again? I'm in Colorado. In Colorado. Okay. I'm in Minneapolis, John. Where are you, John? Minneapolis, Minneapolis. with snow flying, snow flying this morning. Oh, it's like 80 degrees here in San Diego. It's a little different. <laughs> it's pretty warm here in the south, too. It's beautiful today. It was 18 degrees here this morning. <laughs> <laughs> crazy, crazy. Winter looks a little different for everybody. Awesome, cool, we got people from Toronto, California. Awesome, Michigan. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. We still have some folks uh, coming in here, but we'll go ahead and, and get started. Um, Everyone, it's great to have you here. My name is Carly. I'm our Director of Community and Events here at Learn It. And with me today, I'm so humbled and thrilled to have um, so many leaders from the Foundation Fighting Blindness. We're here with Michelle Blaze, John Cornell, and Richard Fabian. John, did I pronounce your last name correctly? Currently <laughs> Cornel, Cornel, Cornel. Uh, excuse me. We've got John and John Cornel from Foundation Fighting Blindness. Um, so thrilled to be here with, with the three of them. And as always, Nathan Kluke, um, who is also from Foundation Fighting Blindness as well, who's been an incredible partner in helping us um, with this program. So a little bit about uh, these Friday sessions on the Learn It side and just some housekeeping items before we get into the discussion. Um, this session today is part of a weekly community event series um, that we do here at Learn It. So um, our goal at Learn It is really to help everyone, whether you're leading a team, whether you're starting a new job, or you're uh, in a position where you're changing careers, to help you really learn the skills needed to thrive in the workplace of Day, um, and keep adapting for the economy of, of the next year, the next five years, the next 10 years. Um, so we want to help you um, become a better leader and, and learn the skills you need to thrive. 
Um, hence why we choose a monthly theme. Um, this month is all around driving impact in the spirit of, of giving and kind of being involved in, in community. How do we be leaders that are really driving impact um, and giving back in some way? Um, and so we focus these events on uh, different topics and they're always led by subject matter experts and guest speakers. Um, and in the spirit of community, we're partnering with Foundation of Fighting Blindness for the, this past quarter, um, and 100% of donations from these events will go towards uh, the Foundation of Fighting Blindness. Amazing work, which you'll hear more about um, today from our speakers. Um, but before we get into the discussion, I want to call on uh, Nathan to give us a little bit of context around um, Foundation, Fight, Foundation Fighting Blindness. Nathan, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks, Carly. Happy Friday. You know, we're so um, proud to have been chosen by Learn It as a community partner um, to raise awareness for blinding diseases. Um, 50 years ago, the Foundation Fighting Blindness was organized to drive research that will provide preventions, treatment, and cures for people affected by retinitis pigmentosa, age-related macular degeneration, Usher syndrome, and the entire spectrum of retinal degenerative diseases. And as we celebrate our 50th year of the foundation, we know we are heading toward the finish line for finding treatments and cures for so many blinding retinal diseases, but we aren't there yet. We're at a critical point in our history. With more advancements on the horizon, the question is no longer if we will win, but how fast we will win. And for the first time in human history, vision loss is being treated and even cured. But these important breakthroughs would stop without research funded by the Foundation Fighting Blindness, which is why you being here today is super critical. Um, you are helping us finish the job and we are truly grateful for your ongoing support. Um, we've had the privilege of being Learn It's community partner for the past six weeks and I've been fortunate to sit on so many great sessions and I've learned a lot from the leaders that have been showcased. But today I'm thrilled that we're gonna be hearing from three of our own dynamic leaders within our organization who I've had the pleasure of working with. So um, I'd love to introduce John Corneal, uh, Richard Fabian, Michelle Glaze. So back to you, Carly, and looking forward to the program today. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nathan. Um, it's been a pleasure to partner with you and Bailey and the entire team at Foundation Finding Blindness. Um, and with that, I want to uh, start introducing our speakers today, um, starting with Michelle and then we'll move to John and then Richard. Um, but I just want to start the conversation with um, each of you sharing a little bit about who you are, you know, how you joined Foundation Finding Blindness or what brought you there and, um, and just a little bit about your story. So Michelle, we'll go ahead and start with you um, and I'll share this context with folks as well. So can see. But Michelle, thanks so much for being here. Absolutely, Carly, thank you for having all of us here today. We are um, just excited to be able to share some information with all of you. My name is Michelle Glaze. I am the Associate Director of Professional Outreach for the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And I'm going to just kind of share my story starting in 2004. I had just landed my first role as a pharmaceutical sales representative after a year of interviewing. I think I had 20 interviews prior to get hired, getting hired on in the medical field with pharmaceutical sales. But in 2004, I was launching into my career and um, I also found out that year that I have a disease called retinitis pigmentosa. As you can Im imagine, a diagnosis like that is life-changing. And in one word, one statement, just a few seconds, you know, you kind of have to reevaluate your future. And for me, when I received that diagnosis, all I could think about was, how am I gonna do my job? How am I gonna drive? How am I going to continue to prosper in my career? At that time, I wasn't having any visual challenges. So I really went into a long phase of denial. Of course, I, I was scared, I was sad, but I was mostly angry and I just wanted to wish it away, ignore it, and pretend like nothing was going on. And that's what I did for many years. Fast forward to 2011. At this time, I was still in the medical career, now also a mother, but I was working in the lab industry and really starting to see changes in my vision. I was um, unable to see to drive at night. I had trouble seeing to drive in the rain or you know, if the, if the weather wasn't just perfect outside. And one day I was traveling across the bridge from Mobile, Alabama into um, what's considered the Eastern shore. And as I went into a tunnel, it was sprinkling 
As I emerged out of the tunnel, it was pouring down rain and I couldn't see it a thing. Luckily, I was able to get myself over to the side of the bridge. Of course, I was scared, but I was grateful that I did not hurt myself or anyone else. And at that time, I realized that my life really was about to change. 2011 was a pivotal year for me. I hired my first set of drivers so that I could continue on in my career. But I was still very embarrassed by the fact that I had something going on that made me different. I was worried about whether or not my colleagues, my management, um, you know, would they see me as still a valuable team member? Would they consider me a, a liability or a risk? Would they see me as being as able-bodied as other employees that were working? Um, I continued on from 2011 until 2018, making adjustments, still very much hiding my vision loss as much as possible. But in 2018, I had just an amazing, um, really experience. It was challenging at the time. I was going through a crossroads in my career and beginning to reevaluate my future. I also had gotten connected to the Foundation Fighting Blindness. I found them online and started to follow this organization who drove research to find treatments and cures for the disease that ailed me. And I wanted to do something. So I had began to participate in some um, fundraising opportunities. And in 2018, I wanted to do something locally. So I reached out to the foundation. Luckily, I got connected to human resources. I still don't know how that happened, but I did. And I spoke with a woman named Pat Dudley. And during that call, I took an opportunity and said, is there any, any way that I could possibly apply for a role with the Foundation Fighting Blindness? Is there anything in marketing or business development? And she shared that the organization was going through some transitions at that time. She asked me to send in my resume, which I did. Um, there was new leadership, Jason Minzo, Ben Yerksa. There were a lot of changes ongoing. And Pat shared some information with me. She said, I probably wouldn't hear anything anytime soon, but to be patient. 30 minutes after I sent her my resume, I received an email back from Pat Dudley. And she said that Jason Menzo would like to have a call with me. And of course, I hopped on the opportunity. That was in March of 2018. From March until August, every month, I made a call to Jason. I sent him an email. I found any reason to reach out and to just really stay in front of him. He had uh, mentioned what is now professional outreach. It's kind of a vision for the future. And I just knew that that was my role. I knew that I was just the right person for that position. In August of 2018, he asked me to put together a business plan. I spent about a month doing so. Every day after work, I came home and I worked on researching and just drafting a document that I think ended up being about 15 pages in length. After reading it, having others proofread it and just going over it hundreds of times, I finally decided that it was good enough to share with him. And I did. That turned into a series of interviews um, from October until February 11th of 2019, when I was brought on board to join the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And I will say that my role has been the perfect marriage of just personal experience and passion paired with a professional background that really lends itself to the work I do every day. This role has been life-changing for me, and I'm so grateful to be on this team with this amazing organization. So that's my, my short story, and thank you for letting me share. Michelle, thank you so much for sharing, and I'm excited to dive even deeper and ask you some questions, but um, so neat that you were able to kind of design a role for yourself, and um, and and I love the idea of that, of you creating the business plan. I can see your diligence, so it's incredible. Um, John, I want to move to you and hear a little bit more about your story and how you got to Foundation Fighting Blindness. I'm going to come off, come off mute. Sure, thanks, Carly. And for those of you listening, we're, we're just going to give these short stories and then we're going to dive a little deeper, as Carly said, and there'll be time uh, for questions after that. Uh, my name is John Corneal. I am the director of Legacy Giving. We used to call it Planned Giving at the foundation. I, uh, I work with people who would consider 
leaving a gift to the foundation, hate to say it, as part of their death, their estate plan. Um, I mean, we're all about raising money. That's what we do. So one source of revenue for us through the foundation is through legacy gifts. And that's what I do. Also a little bit about these diseases. So Michelle, Richard and I, we all have retinitis pigmentosa. That's one of many inherited forms of retinal diseases that we fund research for. Um, RP as for short is very rare. We estimate there's only about 100,000 people in the United States that have retinitis pigmentosa. When you expand the other inherited retinal diseases um, in the family of, of that group that Nathan mentioned some names of, there's about 200,000. So there's really, it's a very rare, small uh, subset of people. But we also fund research for age-related macular degeneration, which most people have heard of. And that affects over 10 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. So they all relate to the retina. That's what we fund research for. That's what we're all about. My personal story is uh, I'm 62 years old. And some of us in the, when we have vision issues, we don't hesitate to tell our age because we're always comparing our age and our station in life with our visual functional level and that type of thing. Uh, so I'm 62. I'm legally blind. I operate 100% by screen reading software. I have what's pretty much down to what we call light perception only. I can look at my computer screen right now and I can see that it's lit up, but I can't see anything in, on the screen right now. Uh, six or eight years ago, it would have been better. I, I drove for the last time uh, one month before my 40th birthday, so a little over 20 years ago. I lost the ability to see the faces of people, my daughters, my grandkids. Now that does not happen overnight because these degree diseases for the most part progress slowly over a period of time. Um, some people for a lifetime, others like Michelle, she was diagnosed later in life. Um, but I was diagnosed when I was age five. <clears throat> my mother and father started to notice that when they would interact with us, us meaning my brother, my older brother has RP as well, um, that our eyes would not track at night. In the car, in a car seat, my mother would lean down, she would say now to kiss me goodnight and my eyes would not follow hers. So they knew something was wrong. They took us into a hospital in Chicago in the mid 1960s and there was very little known about these diseases at the time. And to their credit, the doctors diagnosed it. Um, my, my parents were the type that, unlike the way it is most of the time nowadays, they really didn't tell us what our visual issue was. Uh, we knew we were night blind. We knew sort of that uh, we didn't have peripheral vision that allows us to see to the side, but they really wanted us to lead as, as much of a normal life as possible, normal mean um, as a sighted person would. It wasn't until I was 18 till I really under learned the, the name of my eye disease and that I might go blind by the time I'm 40, as the doctor told me. Uh, but to give you a sense of it's kind of connect some dots a little bit. <clears throat> I mean, I played, I played all sports in high school and I'm not saying this to brag, but at the, I was first, I was first team all conference in football and baseball. I played both of those sports at the small college level, all while legally blind, all having cataracts, all while night blind. So night games and everything's were tra very traumatic for me. Um, got through college. I went to law school, graduated from law school, and I had a 30 plus year career in the private practice of law before joining the foundation in 2010. Um, as kind of Michelle alluded to, having one of these eye diseases is really a lifetime full of adjustments, not just with the way our vision changes, but sometimes our career choices and things we have to do to support ourselves and support our families. And I, I certainly have that in my background. Uh, I left my, I, 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 my law firm was in a community of about 40,000, about 65 miles west of Chicago. That's where I was my entire career. Um, in 2006, my vision got so bad, I left my law firm. I had no idea what I was going to do. I ended up connecting with a state agency in Illinois, ended up at a school for the blind in Chicago. I lived there for five months, uh, didn't even know how to type, and really immersed myself in learning how to type learning the screen reading software that is, has been a lifesaver for me personally and professionally. Went back to knowing that I could continue to practice law just in a different way. And I did that on my own for gosh, another 10 years or so. I started volunteering for the foundation through one of our main, main fundraising events, the Vision Walk in Chicago in 2007. I chaired that event 
for two years, got to know a little bit about a little bit more about the organization, some of the staff, and had a similar conversation with our CDO and said, hey, if there's ever a fit for me at Foundation Fighting Blindness, don't assume that I wouldn't give up the practice of law. I, I'm looking to make sure that I can keep working as long as I need to. So they offered me a position uh, in a part-time capacity as plan giving director in 2010. I stayed in that capacity till I became full-time in July of 2016. I've always worked remotely. So COVID in that sense did not impact me. Um, but now I'm operating in a situation where I may become totally blind. And there's really only about 2% or so of people who have one of these inherited retinal diseases that go totally blind. But certainly it's, our vision is severely compromised and it's made work and personal lives extremely challenging, frustrating and all the other things. So uh, I think I'll stop for there and we'll talk more later. Um, thank you so much. And I really appreciate the context too on, on your specific condition and, and how it evolved throughout your life as well. Um, thank you so much for sharing. And uh, uh, like John mentioned, we'll, we'll dive deeper into some questions. Um, but third, but not last, last but not least, um, yeah. <laughs> Richard would love to have you uh, share a little bit about your background and your story, and then we'll get into questions. All right, Carly, thank you very much. Sure, happy to do that. And uh, John, thanks for covering all that about RP and all that, so I can leave all that out. Uh, so I can uh, share since John was talking about sports. Uh, yeah, I was pretty good in baseball, an all-star pitcher and shortstop and uh, played basketball as well. But one of the things I noticed uh, since I did not know that I had retinitis pigmentosa, it, one of the symptoms is tunnel vision. That means uh, you don't have very good peripheral vision. So I kept missing bounce passes and missing balls rolling on the floor, wondering why did I not see that right away? But, uh, you know, it was always bad getting that uh, ball in the gut, you know, uh, when I missed a bounce pass. Uh, I didn't know what it was. And when I played chart stop, I'd, uh, you know, if I, you know, didn't ground the ball perfectly, uh, you know, then I'd have to find it and throw it. But I was pretty athletic and I could make that happen pretty quick, even though that, you know, half a second to find the ball. Anyway, uh, I was told when I was 21 that I had retinitis pigmentosa. I was going to Georgia Tech at the time and uh, doctor said, well, you know, there's no cure or treatment. Uh, you'll probably be blind in five years because my uncle went blind in five years. It's a hereditary disease. So anyway, I graduated from Georgia Tech as an industrial engineer and decided, well, I'll just live my life. And if I go blind, well, that's what happened, you know? So I made the best of it. And um, I was a graduate industrial engineer and then went, I uh, was worked in the can manufacturing and then working for Slitz Brewing up in Milwaukee. And that's where I found the RP Foundation, which got founded in 1971. As you heard, it's our 50th anniversary. So uh, I was there in Milwaukee. I became chapter president shortly and did my first fundraising event. Uh, I did a bowl-a-thon and raised $1,800. And I was so proud of myself <laughs> raising $1,800. Never done anything like that before. So anyway, as uh, time went on, uh, I had to get another job uh, after Schlitz and I went to Zenith Radio and was manager of industrial engineering for their picture tube division, making picture tubes. Uh, maybe you remember Zenith. I think they worked themselves out of business because they didn't change fast enough to, be, to meet the Japanese uh, flow of things. So what I did after that, that's when I first noticed that my vision was starting to get worse and it was getting more and more difficult to see at night, to drive and everything. I was in my mid thirties. And so I decided to buy my uncle's business in Houston, a wholesale manufacturing company, I mean, wholesale distribution company for chemicals, equipment and supplies. And uh, my uncle had built it up totally blind from retinitis pigmentosa. And so I figured, well, if he did it, I had just a little vision left. I figured maybe I can do better. So I was, I, I, I grew the company uh, and sold it in 1998 uh, to a chemical company and then uh, moved to Colorado. That's where I found the foundation finding blindness. Uh, they were, I mean, I found them as uh, looking for some new people. Uh, so I said, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm just, this was 2006. Uh, I'm at a point now in my career. I have retinitis pigmentosa, as you know. And so I think I, I can do events. I work, you know, I was, uh, I was in rotary fundraising and all of that. So I really knew fundraising very well. And so I told them they need to hire me. And fortunately they did. 
in Denver at the time, and I covered three states doing events like Vision Walk and Walkathon type events and golf tournaments, that type of thing. We raised a lot of money, and then I went and moved into uh, what I do now, which is director of development. And what that means is I do fundraising, working with major donors, corporations, and foundations. And uh, so right now I have a specific level of donors that I work with and across the country, and I enjoy doing that. So it's really been an exciting experience to work with the Foundation Finding Blindness since I'm actually raising money to fund research to, you know, cure and treat a disease that I have. I've actually participated in a clinical trial, so I know something about that as well, you know, using stem cells. So it's been a fun experience, and it's, uh, it's really great being here today with all of you uh, to share our stories and how, you know, we can work together to be greater leaders in this country. All right, back to you, Carly. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, it's awesome to get just some more context on on each of your stories, um, just so we have that as well as as kind of in the in the backdrop. Um, I want to come back to Michelle. Um, Michelle, kind of, and of course, Richard and uh, John, if you have things to add in regards to this point, but. Um, you know, Michelle, what are you most proud of that the foundation does? Um, and how would you say, you know, how does your work specifically impact impact that? Um, you know, the foundation finding blindness is remarkable in a lot of ways. But I think when, when people are diagnosed with these diseases, it is really isolating in many ways. A lot of people don't understand what it means to have an inherited retinal disease. Most people have never met anyone with low vision or blindness. And so when you're diagnosed and you're thinking about all of the things that are to come, there really is a lot of, a lot of question marks. You know, you just, you're not really sure what to expect. And the Foundation Fighting Blindness does a really good job of providing support, guidance, and most importantly, hope for individuals who have these diseases, as well as the family members of folks that are impacted. In my role in professional outreach, what I do on a daily basis is reach out to the eye care community on a national level. We connect with a lot of professionals who interface with patients um, who have the inherited retinal diseases. And our goal as a team is to raise awareness about all of the resources that the foundation has to offer, to provide information about the way that uh, the professional community can support patients and families that are impacted by these diseases and all of the ways in which the foundation provides hope through the clinical research that is being funded and through treatments and cures. So, you know, I think that um, I'm most proud of the fact that the foundation provides answers for families and provides communities for individuals to connect with and drives research, provides hope for the future and optimism in a scenario which can feel very dismal and very um, isolating and very scary. <laughs> so I, I think that that's what I'm most proud of. Hey, Carly, this is, this is John. I'll, maybe I'll try to answer that same thing, if that's okay. That Absolutely. Works? Okay. I, I, it, I was listening to Michelle. So for me, ironically, one of the things I'm, I'm most personally proud of, as I had mentioned when I started with the foundation through the Vision Walk program in Chicago in 2007, um, I've, I've had a Vision Walk team every, every year since then uh, in Chicago and then here in Minneapolis when I moved up here five years ago. And my team this year, our, our walk up here was just at the end of September, the amount raised by my team this year put my team over a million dollars raised um, in the 15 years that I've had a team. And that's all as a volunteer, um, not, not as my day job, so to speak. But I, I'm, really, I'm really proud of that because of, you know, it does relate to the work of the foundation because people, when they learn about the work that we do, and, it's, and a lot of what we do is educate, is because like I think Michelle mentioned, we, we don't advertise a lot. A lot of people don't know about us, but we're a winning organization. And I think from a, a management, a leadership standpoint, that, that's hugely important. It is to me that people, I think, want to be part of a winner, whether it's through athletics, through its, uh, the debate team, you know, whatever it happens to be, people want to be associated with people that are successful. And 
you know, from a not-for-profit standpoint, we're really small. We, we Our gross revenue each year is around $25 million, give or take. The American Cancer Society raises almost a billion with a B dollars every year. But we are second to none as far as medical research is concerned as to how we leverage those dollars. We're the only medical research foundation, I think I can say this confidently, that is really now say that we've cured. We've cured a certain form of a disease that we fund research for. The FDA a few years ago approved the first genetic, um, uh, genetic disease therapy ever in this country for any genetic disease, not just eye diseases, but it happened to be one of our diseases that we started the research for back in the mid nineties. So I'm extremely proud of the accomplishments. The people, our, our um, board of directors made up of about 25 people, you know, at least half, if not three quarters of them are visually impaired themselves or have a family member that are. These are extremely successful people that inspire me whenever I'm around them. Our, our founder, Gordon Gund, is 82 years old. He has retinitis pigmentosa. He definitely remains our inspirational leader. He's a top, one of the top philanthropists in the world, actually. And, and I think lastly, what makes me the most proud is uh, we've attracted 50 or so of the world's, the world's top scientific volunteers that make up our scientific advisory board. And these individuals thoroughly vet every single grant request that we get so that we only give money out to the top research in the world. We keep track of it. We only, it's benchmark based. We don't just write a check. They have to meet certain um, benchmarks and criteria or they don't get the rest of the money. So all of that for me really makes me be, you know, be and feel proud to be part of an organization like that, um, where not only what we're doing to cure these forms of blindness, but there's other diseases that are really paying attention to what we do. Um, you know, cerebral palsy, Parkinson's disease, a lot of these other genetic forms of diseases, we're leading the way in that. And that also makes me extremely proud. You want me to add something to that, Carly? Thank you, John. Yeah, absolutely, Richard. Yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just okay. add a, just a few things. Uh, you know, John and Michelle, you guys covered a lot. So I think one of the things, because uh, we're the world's largest funder of retinal disease research in the world, uh, what's exciting about that is the vision that our current leadership group has brought to the table. Uh, you know, we're, we're doing about over 45 human clinical trials that we either funding or have funded the basic research that have led to those trials that are going on around the world. And one of the most exciting things I think that's happening right now uh, is that we've started our own company to generate gene therapy for these orphan retinal diseases where there's you know, less than 3,000 people impacted by those in the United States, maybe 10 or 20,000 worldwide. But the thing is, is that we're actually getting involved in the manufacturing of genetic therapies and building a team to make that happen. That's pretty exciting that uh, with the amount of funding that we, we have, we're gonna, we don't have a lot of partners to do that. And one of the other things that we do that uh, John didn't bring up was the Retinal Degeneration Fund, which is where it's a venture philanthropy fund where we have people invest in, in foundation fighting blindness. And then we are taking that money and finding biopharmaceutical companies, startups around the world and help funding them to move them forward. At some point, hopefully they'll be taken out by a larger biopharmaceutical company. And one of those did happen recently. And uh, the Foundation Fighting Blindness, you know, got a return on that investment. So that's our goal. We have about 10 or 12 companies that we invest in right now. And so the things that our leadership is doing to move and advance therapies to the finish line is pretty exciting. Back to you, Carly. Thank you, Richard. No, I think, I mean, it's kind of like what John said too, just the amount of the, the emphasis on research um, and finding like solutions to end vision loss. I mean, it's, see, it sounds like such a lofty goal, but just the the progress that the that the organization is making is, is super inspiring. Um, and John, I have a question kind of more directly uh, directed to you, but of course, Michelle and Richard, please also weigh in here. Um, 
for those of us on on this uh, event that you know maybe do not have a vision loss or a physical challenge, you know, or we're pretty able bodied, you know, we may not completely understand what it's like to walk walk in your shoes per se. But um, like you said, John, when we were chatting before, you know, everyone faces their own challenges, um, whether that's in work or life or you know just in the last in the last year and a half have have faced some sort of challenge. Um, and I'm wondering if you can share more on how how you remain resilient. Um, and kind of, I think you've spoke on that with with playing sports, you know, as you as you were losing your vision and the challenges you faced. But I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit on that resilience and kind of what motivates you to you know to keep going. Space muted currently unmuted. Oh. So this it, it's such an individual thing too. Um, the way that we we handle challenges in life, the challenges that face us each day the way that we pursue our work, our profession, our leadership styles, our, our styles in which we collaborate and work with our, our colleagues. We all, there's more than one right way to do that. There's more than one successful and effective way to do that. So, you know, looking back, I think the way that, my, that I was raised, my father was quite a type A personality and my mother was um, not so much. She wanted to tell the whole world that her two sons had this blinding eye disease, and that's why they couldn't see the ball that Richard talked about that hit him in the gut or hit him in the face, um, whereas we, we ignored it and just did not tell anyone about it at all. It was just a matter of powering through, and we had certain expectations of us as children. Our parents never let us get into situations where we could be hurt, but they did everything in their power to not have us think about the vision challenge as being anything other than an obstacle that other people had to deal with. So I kind of tried to carry that, probably not consciously, more subliminally and subconsciously through my life, I think. And I, I do think for me, the participation in particularly team sports has, has made an impact that the being motivated, berated, whatever, by the coaches with all different styles and not wanting to disappoint your teammates um, to, to make sure that you, you're not the one that can't finish that last wind sprint or whatever the situation might be. There's a lot of personal pride, I think, that goes along with that. And that certainly does motivate me. And I, I don't know that I've ever really, I'm sure I have, but the, the experience, the, the emotion of anger hasn't really been one for me. Frustration, absolutely. Um, Difficulty, lack of patience sometimes, yes, lots of different things. But I was the breadwinner in my family. Uh, I have two daughters and two grandkids the entire life, and there's a lot of pressure for me to do that. And there's really only a couple choices. One is to, is to figure out a way, make the adjustment, power through, or give up. And giving up is not, is not the way that I was raised and my older brother has been an inspiration to me. He was a, a very successful trial lawyer in Wisconsin. He's four years older than me. He had to eventually give up. Um, he was probably ready to retire anyway, but the vision definitely caused him to uh, retire because he just could not continue to put his clients at risk with his vision challenges. And I just really feel that uh, and it does sound a little bit corny maybe and cliche, but on those days where, and particularly this time of year, when the, with the time change and it gets dark so early, to have a little bit of light and then know at four o'clock in the afternoon, oh my God, it's, it's dark in my apartment now. It's, it's really kind of discouraging. But I then, I think about other people. I think about my colleague like Michelle, who's, I'm not gonna say her age, but she's younger and she's definitely the best looking of us. Sorry, Richard. Um, <laughs> but she's at a stage right now where Richard and I were, a number of years ago, where she's still relying on her vision, but it's really becoming hard for her. It almost became easier for me when I couldn't rely on my vision anymore. I had to move into the technology stage. So people like Michelle, um, you know, a single mother dealing with these things, really, they do motivate me. We all in our field, we get to meet um, young children, newly diagnosed, watching their parents deal with the, the um, the diagnosis and so many doctors telling them, sorry, there's nothing we can do. Uh, it's a horrible, horrible thing. So while time moves so fast in the science world, um, there, I, I do get motivated and inspired by the next generation. 
and having people do that. The work that we're doing is incredibly important. And being around these other people that I mentioned to you, our board of directors, our staff, uh, our scientific advisory board, our volunteers, they all help motivate and inspire me. Yeah, thank you so much, John. Michelle, anything to add there? Richard, we'll go to Michelle and then Richard, if you have anything to add. Sure. I mean, I think that many of the things uh, John said resonate with me as well. I mean, my, um, I guess my motivation is threefold. First of all, it's just my personality. I have always been uh, extremely stubborn, <laughs> very ambitious, uh, just, you know, that type A personality. So I'm not one to be a victim or allow myself to be a victim. Certainly I have my moments where I feel down or frustrated. Um, and I allow myself that time to feel that, but then it's time to move on, you know, kind of the suck it up buttercup kind of scenario. That's just the way that I look at life. And I think that there are always things that you can find um, to motivate you and to help you feel optimistic and to help you move forward. You just have to search for them and want to find them. So I don't, I don't excuse my vision. I don't, you know, I don't make excuses for why I cannot do something. I figure out how to adapt and overcome. So I think personality is part of it. Um, John mentioned that I'm a single mother. That is also huge motivation for me. My son relies on me and I have always wanted to do for him and give to him the same that ever, you know, every other mother wants to do and give to their child. So I've always worked um, hard to try to make sure that his life is very similar to others. I don't want him to uh, lack experiences because of my vision loss. So he is definitely a motivating factor to me. And then lastly, you know, the work of the organization, the Foundation Fighting Blindness, I, you know, there's so much to be hopeful for in the future. As John mentioned, an FDA approved therapy exists. It's called Luxterna. That doesn't help me, but it does pave the way for other companies who want to get involved with research. There are as Richard mentioned, 45 clinical trials underway. There's a lot of interest in the space because of the work that's being done in the field. And every shot on goal is an opportunity for a treatment and cure. Now, um, there are a lot of clinical trials that are underway that aren't gene specific. Many of the, there are over 300 genes that when mutated can cause an inherited retinal disease. There aren't trials underway for each of those specific retinal diseases, but there are uh, biotech and pharmaceutical companies that are looking at strategies that are gene agnostic. So they would apply to a multitude of individuals. And that for me provides a lot of hope. I may not be able to see well enough to drive one day. I may not be able to, you know, see well enough to fly an airplane but I may be able to see well enough to see my son's face clearly once more. And that's definitely motivating. So um, that's kind of my answer around what keeps me moving forward every day. And um, I'm excited to be able to share some of that and I will hand it over to Richard. Yeah, let me just add to what you guys said. I'll be quick here. Uh, you know, you know, we know I've got challenges. Uh, we've got challenges, right? Everybody's got some kind of challenge. Maybe, you know, not everybody, I guess, but, you know, a lot of people call them disabilities. I am not disabled. I'm challenged. Yeah, I can't see. I listen to everything. I listen to my computer. I listen to my iPhone. It talks to me. So I can, I can do about just about anything anybody else can do. I just do it differently. So I have to find new ways to make things happen. I have to overcome barriers and challenges that I have in my life and with whatever I do. I have a guide dog. I use a white cane. You know, I'm able to get around. I can, I travel the country. No big deal. So it's all a mindset. So you just put it, if you get in your head that you can't do it, well, that's what will happen. So just say you can and anything is possible. So I'll, I'll stop there. Go, go ahead, Carly. I love it, Richard. Yeah, you sound make it sound it's just clear as day when you when you frame it like that. Um, Richard, I actually and I have a question 
directly to you. I feel like you kind of started to touch on it, but you know, what leadership skills or even, you know, you even just talked about mindset have been most crucial for you in, in helping you, you know, you're all in a leadership position, have been in several leadership positions throughout your life, but at Foundation Fighting Blindness now, but what's been most crucial, what leadership skills have been most crucial in helping you, you know, lead teams and kind of, um, you know, be impactful and in, in your role and your job, you know, in your, in your personal life as well. What, what have been the most important skills for you? Sure. These, uh, what I'd like to share about that, Carly, is, um, you know, I mean, there's, you know, project, man- I've been involved in project management. I've been involved in solving problems, whatever it is. I mean, we all deal with that in the industries that we work in. And so what I feel are the most important skills are and techniques that I'd like to use is uh, brainstorming, I have a few things here. Uh, brainstorming, listening, communications, teamwork, and feedback. So brainstorming is uh, where we just go through and let's all let's listen to everybody's ideas. You know, everybody communicate what what are different possibilities or ways that we might attack this problem, get the information to define the problem well. And then we want to, you know, listening is a form of communication for sure. Uh, And I think listening to your colleagues and to your team and really understanding what is on their mind and really getting their communication is important. And then the communication part is once you have something going and you've got you developed a potential solution is being able to communicate that to everyone so that everybody understands what the uh, what the project is going to be or what the direction we're going to take. Teamwork is where we want, definitely want to get a, the team involved, not just be a one person deal, but let's get a team involved because we want everybody, you know, channeling their efforts towards the same goal. And then we want to get feedback. Feedback is important because you want to know what worked, what didn't work. And that way you can make tweaks, you can make adjustments to your solution, and then hopefully come up with something that will solve the problem. So those are the type of type of the techniques that I try and use in my everyday life and in, in my work with the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Thank you so much. Um, John, anything to add there or Michelle? We'll go to John and then Michelle. Yeah, that, I was trying to think about that question and thanks for sharing that a little bit in advance to help us prepare Carly. Um, you know, I, I guess I have self-employed pretty much my entire life in a small business and never was really in the the corporate world. And yes, we're a not-for-profit, but we're a corporate organization structurally and a lot more people that I'm interacting with than I ever have in the past, an actual organizational chart, an actual human resource director, things that were foreign to me in the self-employed world. And, you know, being part of a, a big team, a national team, a regional team with everyone having their own, and probably a lot of you in this call can relate to this. You have, you have your own goals, you have your own expectations for your own work, but you also have to recognize that, and again, a cliche, but the rising tide lifts all boats, that the success of the organization through, through collaboration is really, really what it's all about. And it kind of gets back to that, that uh, winning attitude that, you know, the, the offensive linemen in a football game, they don't get a lot of credit. They don't get a lot of attention, but without them being successful, the quarterback and the running backs and the wide receivers are never going to be able to do their job. And we happen to be in an organization where our leadership and our management recognizes that, stresses that incredibly well. And I think too, that I'm sure all of you have heard this too. There, there's a difference between hearing somebody and listening. Listening means that you're really paying attention and you're not just going through the motion. It's a little bit like there's a difference between uh, having poor eyesight. You can have poor eyesight, but you can still have great vision. So I try to think of those things. I'll, I'll tell you that I don't do it as much as I should at, from a conscious standpoint. You know, life gets in the way. Uh, every day is stressful. Every day has it, its uh, challenges. But conversations like this and hearing Richard and Michelle talk and just being a part of this group who I know some, some of your backgrounds and where you're coming from does help me to think about it. And it really is, is important to do that. Um, keep some basic principles in mind of communication, listening, respect for other ideas and opinions, humility, recognizing you don't know it all. 
Um, so uh, some of the things that you know we that are really really important to our everyday lives that I hope that we can get back to as a as a society really is respect and humility and everything that we all need to to get along. And I'll Michelle. just add a, a different perspective, um, not to repeat anything that um, John and Richard have shared, but I think that I think of three three things come to mind um, when thinking about leadership and working with others, collaboration, teamwork, all of those things that were mentioned before. Proactivity, I think, is very important. Um, you know, you have to start somewhere, and sometimes. When you are working as a team, you see areas that potentially need improvement and being proactive and, and taking initiative to step in and help the team and to further collaboration is important. Um, persistence is another factor that I think is really, um, it can be very impactful in any leadership role. I mean, we're all faced with different challenges Sometimes we start a path and we need to adjust, but you have to be persistent. You have to stay the course and keep moving things forward. And the last is passion. I think that having a passionate um, view of, of your role and what you're doing and what you're working towards is hugely impactful on a multitude of levels. And passion could really help drive <laughs> leadership in a lot of ways. So. Those would be the three ads that I would um, include in this conversation. Space, I, mean, I, want to, I want to tip in something with, with the last thing that Michelle said. This is John. Absolutely, um, absolutely. I, I think the passion part of it really does greatly describe our work at the foundation. In order to be successful, you have, you have to believe in what you're doing, whether it's a a product you're manufacturing, selling, it's a service you're providing, it's knowledge that you're imparting to others. If you don't believe in, in that, people that you're working with, that you're trying to develop relationships with, they're going to see that. And I just don't think you're going to be as successful. So yes, all three of us on this, this uh, call today, we have a vested interest in the success of our organization. But I'm confident, I didn't know Richard or Michelle before the foundation, but there's no doubt in my mind that they brought the same passion to their prior careers that they did. Uh, they do now to the foundation. And I think that's a huge part of um, collaboration and leadership. Our leaders, our senior management are extremely passionate what we do and they believe in it. And I think that's incredibly important for our success. Yeah, no, thank you so much, John. I think it's it's palpable. You can feel it in someone's work. You can see it in someone's work and, and the way they, they move through things when there's when there's passion. So, um, and I think that can be motivating for others as well. Um, I want to, as we kind of wrap up, kind of close up, we had a really great question actually from the audience too. And I think all of you kind of interwove it into the importance of, of relationships. Um, and kind of how that has, those have been important to you throughout your life, whether it's mentorship. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering just in, in your experience, uh, what role your, your, you know, your family and your relationships have played um, in, in your success at Foundation Fighting Blindness, in, in just your experiences in, in experiencing vision loss, you know, what, what role have the people in your life uh, played, played throughout? And, um, and, and how has that kind of impacted you or, or driven you? This is Michelle. I'd be happy to, to start and kind of dive into that. And my answer to this might be surprising. You know, we all expect when we're going through challenging times, for us, it's, you know, vision loss amongst, amongst other things, but we all go through challenging times. And during those times, you know, we expect to get support from our family and our friends. And certainly I have. My family and friends have been in a huge way, um, just a net for me and a support system for me as I've gone through my adjustments and challenges and changes with vision loss. But what has surprised me most and really impacted me at a, in, a, in a way that I never anticipated was the, and has been and continues to be, the support and encouragement that I have received from complete strangers. 
you know, it's remarkable how many individuals in my community, um, colleagues, you know, people that I've, that I've maybe interfaced with, but aren't really truly friends with, or even, even people that I've never met before that I'm just in a, in the same scenario or situation with people are highly encouraging. They are supportive. They want to help. They want to understand most of the time. I have had complete strangers change my life in ways that they have, they, they probably don't even realize. Um, you know, people that have come to me and said, wow, you know, I'm really inspired by what you do. Uh, I think that, you know, you're remarkable for continuing to move forward, even when you're faced with something so devastating. Those types of um, comments and accolades, it's, it's impactful. I mean, I, I have been just amazed, truly, by some of the things that I've heard. And I will share, and, and this is something that my son has said to me and that has really inspired me. And um, of course, he, he and I are very close. But even as a child, he has come to me in situations like baseball games. You know, I'll, I'll go with him to baseball games. We get a ride there. He'll go off. He'll do his thing. You know, I'm sitting in the stands trying to find him out on the field, which is challenging. But he is the one who has encouraged me more than anybody to share the fact that I have vision loss. You know, mama, don't be afraid to share. Tell people so that they can help you. My child is the one who, you know, taught me that. So anyhow, I just, I think that there are many different um, ways in which we're inspired and encouraged. And um, sometimes those inspirations come from people that we don't even anticipate. Space, hey Richard, why don't you go next? I think we've only got four or five minutes total, Carly, left. Well, I won't, I won't talk too long. I'll just say, you know, pretty much, yeah, my, uh, my wife, uh, my family have been very supportive all my life. And, you know, it's, you know, it's a very crucial part, you know, to have a partner that will, you know, be your guide dog, uh, you know, when you're going around or doing anything or, you know, you have to get a ride, friends to give you a ride to go somewhere. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's just part of what you have to do. And I think the most uh, critical thing there is being willing to ask for help. Uh, that's what happens to a lot of people. They just don't want to ask for help, but I do. And uh, it does make a big difference. There are plenty of people out there. They, they, how can I help? They, they're willing to help. And the last thing I'll share is my brother always helps me when I play golf. I could see the ball on the tee and he was amazed. I hit the ball out of sight. Of course, you're supposed to laugh at that because it really doesn't have to go very far <laughs> to be out of sight for me. But in any case, uh, go ahead, John. Richard, I laughed the first 10 times I heard you say that joke, but it's still funny. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I think I've mentioned my family. My family has been extremely supportive. Actually, they, they offer more help than I am, uh, that I want, because I, I want to be independent. I'm living alone for the first time in my life the last six months due to really struggle with some relationships and the strain that vision loss and any other challenges like that can put on a relationship. Um, so I'm, I'm very aware of that and try to try to be aware of that um, in interactions with others. And Michelle, what you said seriously about strangers, I just want to tell one quick story. I travel all over, I travel all over too by myself, airplanes and airports and hotels like Richard and Michelle do, um, does. And I have to rely, put so much trust in other people, people that I don't know. So recently I, I flew to Raleigh for the foundation and a, a guy picked me up um, here at my apartment. Lyft driver, I have a thing where I stay with the car. I tell them this on the way there, that if they'll go in and find me somebody to, to guide me, it's usually the wheelchair people, although I won't do a wheelchair, I just need a guide. <clears throat> I'll stay with their car so they won't get towed or ticketed. So this gentleman did this and he came out and said, I can't find anybody inside. Uh, happened to be in you know, a terminal where there weren't a lot of people around, I guess. So he said, come on, he grabbed my arm. He goes, you go in with me, I'll take you to the counter. I said, no, we can't leave your car here. Uh, I don't want you to get towed or ticketed. Let's think this, we'll figure it out some other way. He goes, no, come on, come on, let's go. You're, you're more important to me than my car. That's what that man said to me. Doesn't even know me. And he meant it. I could feel it. He was saying that sincerely. 
So he ran me inside, got me to the counter, and I said, get out there and take care of your car. And I gave him a hug. And there's so many experiences like that, just, you know, I, recognizing that the goodness in the vast majority of people out there is hugely inspiring and motivating and helps, I think, keep all of us going. Uh, I'm, I'm like tearing up a little bit. That's so cool. Um, Richard, do you have anything to add there? No, I'm good. Okay. All right. Um, amazing. Well, I think since we only have two minutes left, um, <laughs> we'll, we'll end there. Um, I really want to thank, um, everyone for being here today. Uh, John, Richard, and Michelle, um, I'm super inspired by your stories and just who you are as, as people. Um, and I want to thank you so much for being here. I want to thank Nathan and Bailey, who are both on this call, for uh, rallying everyone to make this happen. Um, if you enjoyed today's session, I would love to encourage you to learn more about Foundation Fighting Blindness. Again, it's been an incredible partnership over the last two months. Uh, I put the link in the chat here to learn more about our partnership uh, for this month. Um, so go ahead and click on that. Um, and then I want to leave a, one last moment. Nathan, if you want to come on, say any last words, any last words from, from our team here. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you all for, for being here. And John, Richard, and Michelle, thank you again for sharing your stories and, and talking about resilience and the impact your leadership has. And if you're interested in getting involved in the Foundation Fighting Blindness, we have chapters across the country. You can email us at chapters at fightingblindness.org and we will plug you in. We'd love to help. So thank you very much. Carly, thanks for having us as always. Space, mute, currently on mute. Thank you to everybody. All right, thanks. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, everyone. All, All right. right. Take care. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Happy Bye. Friday. That meeting will leave. Cancel, but leave.